five minutes time because I accidentally switched by moving the moving the phone which is in a delicate position um, I was uh, I was uh, accidentally turning it on to light but I don't really care if you guys see me tune up for example that's a cool thing to do Instrument. Instrument.
Okay, welcome to another uh, workshop in the uh, Creative Council series. Salad for uh, Alaska. Come and get a salad. And uh, I'm actually not in Anchorage where most of the workshops are uh, held. I am beaming in or out or up to you from Homer. I have a studio here where I'm overlooking Kachemak Bay. Sorry, you can't see right now, but you are welcome to the view of one of my trees. And uh, also welcome to the view into my mind, um, the way I think that it operates when uh, what I'm composing. So I'm excited and uh, grateful to be able to, um, to share some of my tricks, maybe some of my insights, and maybe some of the things I'm still struggling with as a composer uh, over the next hour. So uh, maybe I should start by telling you a little bit about me. Actually, no, I'll tell you a little bit about the workshop first. It does say in the description that it's going to be fast-paced and fun-filled, and I hope it will. Uh, I have held myself to uh, 10 different uh, kind of areas, and tips, tricks, whatever you want to call it, approaches that are active when when one composes, whether you're aware of it or not, or whether I'm aware of it or not, these are elements that I think are um, very uh, prominent. And some of these things you've talked about or has been talked about and have been talked about by other workshop leaders that I don't see anything wrong with enforcing what has been said before or coming at it from a different angle. Um, and also, you will just hear about things that you probably already know in a different way, which I personally really like. Uh, I like to be inspired by other people, and hopefully some of this will be inspiring to you. Um, we are going to be uh, talking about making music. Um, I'll define what I think about a uh, composition uh, very soon. Uh, but in general, um, I'm going to be talking about the basic building blocks of music and so on, but not really call them that. This is not going to be a kind of a school academic type approach. This is really just going to be me telling you stories of different pieces of music that I wrote and how they came about. And as I do that, and as I talk about how I wrote them or how I couldn't write them or whatever, then that will sort of um, uh, throw some light over the different aspects of protest that, that we're talking about. Um, so, uh, but in short, I can say yes, melody and rhythm and harmony, of course, the main building blocks. Uh, also, how words, images, improvisation, which is I'm big on improvisation myself. I'm a, often a jazz musician. <laughs> Uh, collaboration, another important one, and then various musical games, mind games, whatever you want to call it, stimuli that you can kind of throw in in front of you very simply um, to to get going, inspiration tools for making music. And uh, I'm 100% certain that you can easily apply all of the things I'm talking about today without any further education or anything like that. Uh, in fact, I think probably you're doing a lot of this already, but maybe you can make your own um, process into a bit of a method so that you become a little bit more aware of where you can change it, alter it, and so on. So it's light-hearted, light-footed. <laughs> uh, let's get going. So um, how do I know anything? I have a long, longer, longer history as a composer, musician, producer. Um, and uh, started out as a um, classical, as a child of a classical music family, uh, where the only music, only records that had drums on it was uh, two actually. There was a Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald record, and one one with Louis Armstrong and one with Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald. So, uh, you know, there was my role models were Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, big classics, and I have classical training in playing and, and composing music, but that's not where I'm going today. Um, after I came to Alaska, which is about 20 years ago, I uh, come up with three different solo albums that are all in the jazz idiom, and I've played on many, many other people's music, uh, so I like all kinds. And I'm currently working on a song project. Um, 
to record my songs because they're driving me crazy. Just like the jazz albums, the music that hasn't been recorded and hasn't been committed to something that other pe people can hear at any time, it sort of drives one a little nuts. So often the drive to compose is um, basically it's driving me crazy. You can't write it and finish it. So, regardless of whether you're Mozart or Martin or Mary, um, you probably will all feel pretty similar when you make stuff. So you don't always know where the ideas came from, um, but you can be pretty sure that it's based on something that you already know musically and, and who you are personally and what's happening in, in and around you. There, there is no other way that music can come about. It is an expression of you in some way or other. And um, if I was going to define composition, I would say making music that didn't already exist. That's my broad definition of it. Um, there's many different ways. Um, why if I was going to define math, I've already said I often do it because I can't help the tidying clutter of my mind. <laughs> In but we do what we know. Um, so I was going to say a little bit more about the composition, but I feel like I've talked enough, so I'm just going to go into the first uh, tip. And I am going to be writing these as we go along, but I have prepared tip number one. So you're getting started. Recognize, accept your idea. Recognize it, accept it. Um, it's not relevant for everyone, because some people, uh, to, to really think about this, because some people are blessed with a lack of uh, at least seriously uh, hampering self-censorship. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is for me, and this is for, uh, for those of you who may be of the kind of self-questioning type. Uh, don't reject whatever it is you're working on, however it came to you, however you are making the um, music, the the idea is uh, holy, blessed, meant to be part of the world. It is. It's really amazing that we have brains at all, that we have systems at all, that we are alive at all. Whatever silly, stupid little idea or whatever divine incredibly too big to really belong to you or to anybody else, whatever idea. Don't let any grain of self-doubt come between you and your enjoyment of working with your music. It, uh, it's so important. It's the freedom that we have to, to play and, and make music. So the first, the first uh, tip that, that overlaps everything and overarches everything Accept and cherish your idea. So, I don't know what I'm going to do with these. I'll put, put it down here. So now begins the work. Because now I have uh, a pen and I have my piece of paper. And idea number two, uh, or uh, tip number two, is basically uh, write, compose on your instrument or sing, or just hear. Rule number two, hear it on your instruments or sing. I have excellent handwriting, I've realized on the, on the keyboard, but I try not to make noise on it. But basically tip number two I'm going to talk about is, is, um, is writing on the instrument and whatever instrument you play. Now, I happen to play a lot of instruments, so I'm going to spend a little time on this number two because I want to give you uh, some examples of how uh, I have been writing music in the past. And I will say that um, as, an, uh, as an instrumentalist, I am particularly kind of sensitive to my hands uh, so I'll maybe start, well, I'm in front of the piano, so I can, I can do, for example, when I learn to play a chord shape, and I think you can see my hands up here, so I'm not going to play it here because it's very deep, dark notes, but if 
if I do, you know, if I just do the hat shape, and then just don't press, just, I'm talking about generating ideas, just putting my hand on the piano, you know, the little babies go, it's an accident, a cat walking on the piano can do this, but it is. I really believe that the way you actually touch the instrument is going to be that moment that you know that's the when your first idea might come to you I'll give you a couple of other examples uh, and then I'll actually play you some music uh, that has been recorded but um, uh, we uh, we can do examples here so I learned to play guitar quite early but I can tell you I got this guitar not this one but a very similar one from my parents when I was five years old and it was way too big for me full size and so for at least five or maybe six years it was standing in the corner and I was obsessed with it and the only thing I could do was and I just loved the sound of it and so I would it, by the time I actually got a guitar course, you know, after school guitar course, on um, my, uh, I think I was about 11, and I learned to play chords, that I was so into the sound of it and so in tune with the instrument that I was already kind of all about touching it. And I think that that has, is how I play any kind of instrument. So once you learn some chords, you probably learn, you know, E, and you'll probably learn A minor, the first chords you learn. And then you learn D. And if you play ukulele or mandolin or whatever you know, the mandolin, you know, we, we've all, you know, bass, we, we learn chords. And you learn them with focusing on your left hand, typically, with, or if you're left or your right hand, but your chord shape hand. And I would say, let these chord shapes kind of, and then try to move these chords up and down. And that's what I did. So. So then I love the E because it's like the, it's the guitar chord, right? So I did come up to something like this not that long ago. Another thing is this melodica, which is kind of like a, a piano on the go. 
and and again it's the shape and i'm working on something right now so this i'm sure you heard you know a lot of people have one of these it's a toy instrument i think but now it's time to be taken very seriously <laughs> Actually, I, at the moment, I do this. And I know something's going to come out of that because it's, it's literally, again, just me playing around with it. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about how, how we sort of capture those ideas later on. Um, and then the other, another instrument that I play uh, is the trumpet. And of course, trumpet is a melody instrument. And I hadn't composed much on uh, the trumpet before because I uh, I have the piano and I have some piano ability. And therefore, I, even if I'm probably a better trumpet or guitar player, I still feel like it's very, it's, it, I love composing on the piano and just sitting there and changing the sounds on my keyboard. And that's another thing that also can inspire you, you know, changing the samples so you get some ideas. But for those of you who play a melody instrument, like a saxophone or a trumpet or a flute or violin or a string instrument, um, you you can you can get melodies together while you're practicing your even while you're warming up. So my trumpet teacher, when I was doing my studies, uh, was very insistent that I would compose on the trumpet. That's what he does, and he's a, he's a really successful trumpet player. And uh, so he says, yeah, I, I write most of my stuff uh, on trumpet. So I started doing it, and, and one time when I wrote this piece, it's like... Uh, and it's kind of a bluesy thing, you know? literally just something that probably has been played before most of it but it's I'm just kind of maybe going maybe I'm practicing blues uh, arpeggio or something and then the composer part of my brain just goes in and goes okay how about you play this and then that I'll play for you later. So, so number two uh, is you can compose on your instrument and you All can right. also sing, of course. Uh, I sing too, but I'm not going to sing a whole lot for you today. Uh, but one of the pieces I'm going to play for you in a second is came about when I was moving. That's another thing you can just something comes into your head. Typically I wake up every morning and there's one song or one little riff or something and I try to write it down. I'm glad I've learned how to do that so I can write it down. But the other thing that happens is when I move, when I run, when I ski, uh, either I hear some really boring pop song from the 60s or something that just kind of goes in with the rhythm when I'm a little tired. But when I'm biking, then I often get a different kind of a rhythm. So uh, one of the songs I'm going to play you was was, uh, was written while I was biking, and then then you know it kind of I was singing it to myself because I could hear it in my head. <laughs> oh, what is this? How on earth do I get this down? So. Um, The, we're still on, we're kind of moving a little bit into, I'm moving ahead of myself, but I want to still talk about how you generate ideas, or that it is, yes, this is how ge ideas are generated for real, your way is for real, <laughs> and maybe you don't need that affirmation, but I do, so this is for me too. Recognize, accept your idea, number one, two, idea on your instrument or while you're singing. And yes, most uh, compositions, most songs, most unfinished compositions, whatever it is, 
they basically come from an emotional situation or a some kind of other yeah some kind of inspiration and emotional inspiration without it we wouldn't really feel like writing I, I think uh, some you know if you're a professional composer you just sort of have discipline and you go ahead and do it like with any job right you, you don't need emotional uh, inspiration to get up and put your boots on and go out there and do what you have to do that that is your job and for a professional composer for sure but for the stuff that feels meaningful for us there is another layer and that is uh, life experience things that happen to us so now we come into where I'm going to tell you little stories about uh, some songs and then I want to play you how they came about on the instrument that they came about on and then uh, maybe just play you a little snippet of it the way it was re ended up recorded just to, to kind of illustrate the, the steps and um, I, I can uh, put the, the links to these uh, videos in the in the chat while while we're listening to them I hope um, if not then they, they can be available later and thank you I have my own YouTube channel with my full name on it so you can find them there. first this is one of the oldest songs that I'm going to be recording uh, this year some point soon I think and it's called goodbye train it wasn't in initially called that but it was something to do with the train and I was uh, in Paris actually I was yeah I was in Paris uh, traveling doing some kind of interrail thing on my way home from London so it was written on a train and it was written after you know a breakup I was at school drama school I was probably 22 23 so it's an old song and um, and it was written very much from the situation that uh, that I was in and I think this is the most organically uh, come together song I've ever written it's one of my favorites for that reason because I can't actually remember writing it I just remember looking at the little table by the window and I remember writing and I had a little guitar a little uh, tenor four, four string guitar so I even wrote it not even on a proper guitar but it just was so it just all kind of woof, came in together that's not a technique for writing that I can teach but it's totally how all of us get ideas sometimes and so this idea from the situation of leaving was um, and then and then again the, the feeling of that particular neck on the guitar so this chorus chord structure this is the main it's in G so C and G I just knew those chords right and then as I was getting better with finger picking and everything like that then of course I could do you know something like something that I would be doing but I had all of those pieces together so as a and what I could really hear was this sort of train flute or something that was kind of whistling so I had that in there all the time as a as an element and so character of the train um, so um, I could play a little bit of that um, 
from a live concert. This is not a studio recording, so it will be recorded in the studio. But uh, here's here's a little bit of that. <laughs> I could just as well have written, played that for you live, but um, again, it doesn't change very much in the beginning, um, and then it sort of builds with drums and bass and violin backing and everything. Um, but the emotional inspiration is a sad one. It, it's a young one, it's a vulnerable one. It's me at early 20s. I wrote it, and then when I record it, when I perform it, I still try to do honor to the original situation, which was um, that, you know, that, that little girl or that young woman in me is definitely very much still there, so that's what I try to also honor in performance. Um, okay, so then another example that of uh, how a composition then can evolve a little bit uh, is, um, is this one. Uh, the, the one I told you about was a bicycle. The bicycle ride was through kind of Green Point, Brooklyn area. It's not super, super busy. There's plenty of room on the road. And I was, <clears throat> excuse me, biking very, very fast. And I um, just got into this rhythm that I didn't think what it was. It was kind of like my body was making the rhythm. And the rhythm was um, uh, not something that was easy to write down. With, but No. Simple tax returns only. Snap your W-2 and file Fed and State for free, guaranteed. Who could have known that extra love could add extra pounds? 
before that the smallest change. Life is great when you have lots of choices. I mean, who hasn't had a little party in their head when getting off at a highway exit and seeing two dozen fast food places vying for your attention? Please, Colonel, I'm married. But, but this isn't the case in the CPU world, where you basically only have two choices on desktop, AMD or Intel. So how did this happen? I mean, with as many computers as there are in the world, do no other companies want a piece of the action? To understand why there are only two CPU options for your PC, we have to go back to the first PC, the original IBM personal computer from 1981. IBM chose the Intel 8088 CPU to power the machine, which was based on the x86 instruction set. This ended up being an enormously consequential choice as the IBM PC exploded in popularity and pushed lots of its competitors out of the market because it was a versatile, well-built computer that offered great value for money at the same time. This meant that software developers wanted to write programs for the IBM PC and compatibles that utilized x86 CPUs, meaning Intel quickly became a very powerful name in the microcomputer CPU space. So powerful, in fact that they ended up licensing out the x86 architecture to other companies in order to keep up with demand without having to manufacture x86 chips completely on their own, but still make money. Ironically, AMD was one of these licensee companies, and although Intel and AMD obviously remain rivals to this day, AMD still has an x86 license, which it's used at various times to beat Intel at its own game. Obviously, their rise in lineup is the one currently giving Intel fits, but this was also true back in the 1990s, when AMD started improving upon the x86 design and competing directly with Team Blue rather than just being Intel's second source chip supplier. Although AMD wasn't the only x86 licensee that tried to make inroads into the market, they did have the knowledge and resources to become a serious contender, as they were already a publicly traded company that had multiple chip fabs. Other firms that had access to the x86 architecture simply didn't compete all that well. One notable example is Cyrix, who tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Intel's new Pentium lineup in the mid-1990s. Cyrix promised big-time performance, but their chips rarely delivered. And they made an infamous mistake when they decided to focus on integer performance to compete with the Pentium. At the time, Cyrix thought that the trend of most desktop programs using mostly integer-based processing would continue. But what actually happened is that the low-cost but powerful Pentium became so popular, developers instead coded for its floating-point unit. And if you're confused about the difference between integer and floating-point, you can learn more about it in this video. So Cyrix's challenge Possibly didn't last very long, and other potential competitors and were then trying to, to the game compared to what the red and blue well. were offering. Think about how right. Apple switched from PowerPC to Intel, partly because Intel chips were simply more powerful per watt. And of course, the next major innovation in desktop CPUs, 64-bit processing, was developed by none other than AMD, who subsequently cross-licensed that technology to Intel, paving the way for the modern era of x86-64 computing, employed by virtually all modern PCs, and making it even harder for smaller chip makers to get a foothold in time to be relevant. Now, of course, because most of these issues revolve around the x86 architecture, chip makers who have focused on other instruction sets have done quite well. Qualcomm, you might have heard of them, for example, is a huge force in the mobile space with its ARM-based chips, and Apple has made headlines recently for releasing its non-x86 M1 processor, which offers very impressive performance for Mac users. But if you're a PC loyalist, I wouldn't expect the duopoly to disappear anytime soon. No worries. At least this red versus blue fight shouldn't involve politics. Or fragments. Speaking of fights, stop fighting with your finances and use our sponsor, FreshBooks. Their easy-to-use accounting software is designed specifically with you in mind, the small business owner. FreshBooks has everything you need to manage your books, invoices, expenses, time tracking, and more.
It's a big box. <laughs> People love a big box. And in this big box is a new uh, monitor from Dell, which apparently is, hold on, let me look at my notes, the world's first 40-inch ultra-wide curved 5K 2K monitor. Now, when you see a statement like that, you can be pretty sure it's not the world's first anything. That's too many qualifiers. And if the marketing partner was just trying to tell you as much about the monitor as they could in one sentence, then they kind of screwed up the whole concept of world's first. So, bad marketing either way. But it could still be a great monitor, so let's check it out. Uh, right after I get in this box, see my trusty uh, shears that I keep in my pocket. Oh, uh, this is like a giant briefcase. This is a fun kind of thing to unbox. Uh, in it, we have a calibration report. This is showing us that in sRGB mode, which is like regular web kind of color space, the delta E's, which is the difference between what the color shows and what like the uh, perfect color is. Those delta E's are very low, which is awesome. They're actually below a delta E of one. A delta E of like two and three is like what the human eye can even discern. So that's very good. However, this is a monitor marketed towards uh, color professionals. So if you're doing graphic design or other color critical work, it's probably not going to be working in sRGB all the time. You might be in something like Adobe RGB or DCI P3, which they also have here, but the performance isn't as good. It's still just barely over two. It's, it's all under three. So that's pretty good. We have the, I don't want to say non-verbal, but one of those uh, instruction manuals has all pictures. Those could be hit and miss. I'm going to try not to look at that. <coughs> Display port cable. Probably going to use that. Uh, this is a USB, I believe that's type B, like uplink cable. So that's because on the back of this monitor, there's going to be a USB hub. You can plug lots of stuff in. And then from the monitor to the PC, you'll have this cord. HDMI. We're, we're going to look closely at this. You probably don't want to use HDMI with this monitor if it's anything like other 5K, 2K monitors we've seen in the past. And then there is a Thunderbolt, actually a Thunderbolt 3 cable. These things are pretty expensive, or at least they used to be. It's pretty nice for them to include, what is that, like a 4 or 5 foot cable? Nice. USB Type-C. So you can also uh, do DisplayPort. You can run DisplayPort over USB Type-C using this cable. Nice. Wow, there's a bunch of numbers on this thing. Can you see this? Here, look at this upside down one. One is the base of the monitor stand. Cool, I like this type of base. Uh, I prefer this to having like legs that jut out because you can just put your phone or your wallet on it. I think that's cool. This is not too big either. Half. Now here's the little two in the two bucket. Guess what? It's the neck. You can kind of see already this is a more professional executive look as opposed to like a gamer look. Is this integrated? Tool this? Yes. Yes, it is. Snap that on there and then just give this a twist with the fingers. Cool, and yeah, I can see there is a cable management channel. I like that stand. It feels robust. It's like anodized aluminum. That's good. Power cable, no power brick yet. Hopefully, it's integrated into this monitor. It's a very large monitor, so I kind of expect the power brick to be integrated into there. And now I get to take this whole thing out. Ah! Oh, I think it's just telling me to leave this on until later. What is this trying to say? Uh, oh. Okay, okay. I dig it. Now I can get rid of this. Ah, uh, we're back. <laughs> That's a 360, baby. Uh, I think I can actually assemble this without having to take this shot off. This is actually so nice. So many times, especially with a really big TV, it can be difficult to get it out of the box, but then have to lay the whole thing down on its face while you get the legs on it, and then you're looking for something soft you can safely lay it on, putting a blanket down, big pain in the butt, that you don't have to mess with this time because they they thought of everything. That's great. Now I just go like this. It's about 20 and a half pounds. Not like unruly. Okay. Uh, we have uh, this much elevation. Oh, it goes really nice and low. That's cool. That high. It actually has built in swivel quite a bit. That's nice. And for tilt, you get what? The standard? Yeah. Like 20. Well, actually, tilt's up pretty high. Any rotation? What? A little bit. I mean, no one is going to use this in vertical mode. The reason that rotation is nice is that it's easier to plug stuff in. But uh, 
you couldn't even turn this sideways if you wanted because it would have to be so much higher. Uh, so this is a reasonable. It's nice that they give you a little bit. <coughs> you know, if your table is not level or something like that. This has a really clean look. This button over here, it's just a nice little dimple for the power button, and a really premium looking and feeling joystick. I, it looks like they're they want Apple users to use this. I can't wait to explore the OSD. Okay, and then looking at the I/O, I like the I/O labels here. This is almost like a soft touch kind of plastic here. Uh, power cord goes in there, HDMI 1 and 2, again, I wouldn't use those. Um, they are HDMI 2.0, not 2.1. And at this point, in 2021, if you're spending $2,100, I almost feel like that's almost right there I would buy this monitor. Because in a couple months, it's just, everything's gonna be 2.1, or it should be. So, I don't know, let's just put an asterisk on that and keep going. Uh, display port 1.4, oh, here you go. This is the integrated um, USB hub. You can see they actually, it shows a picture of a laptop with a lightning bolt, and it says 90 watts. So yeah, we have an RG45 jack for the internet. We have a uh, 3.5 millimeter audio jack. I believe there are four USB type A ports that are 10 gig on this thing. Oh, here it is, down here. There's another USB type C down there too. That's really cool. Especially if you want to hook up like your own SD card reader or something like that. Yeah, this is kind of a weird screen because it's a 21 by 9 screen, which is normal ultra wide, but it's 40 inches, whereas most are 34 inches. I have a super ultra wide, which is 49 inches at my desk. So it's wider than that, but I don't know. Of course, this is higher resolution. This is 5120 by 2160, so 2160p is 4K. You can think of this as just being like the resolution of a 4K monitor, but then you have like an extra third. So it's like, it's like a 4K ultra wide, but they call it 5K, 2K which is annoying. But the reason I was picking on them for saying this is the world's first curved foot move. This is not the first 5K 2K. There have been other monitors. We were playing <coughs> on G1 back in November of 2018 on Linus Tech Tips that had this same resolution except at 34 inches. And you can buy that one now for about fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars. So I don't know I don't know why you would buy this now to be honest. Uh, but we're gonna plug it in and check it out anyway. But before we plug it in, here's a message from our sponsor, Yeelight. E-Lite's M2 smart bulbs offer a nice <coughs> integration with Google Assistant as well as customizable colors for different scenes. For current E-Lite users, you can enter for a chance to win a mystery box valued at $300 with the latest Google Nest Hub and E-Lite smart lights included. If you're not currently using E-Lites, you can still enter for a chance at winning a $1,000 <coughs> mystery box. Check out the giveaway link in the video description. The giveaway ends on January 31st, 2021. So go! All right, this is like a little tutorial uh, teaching you how to use the OSD and uh, some initial setup, kind of like what you do on a TV, but you don't normally do on a monitor. First option I have here is to enable always on USB-C charging, other USB charging, and uniformity compensation, all of which will uh, increase power consumption uh, if you wanted to adhere to the Energy Star rating that it has, you have to keep those off. All right, this is not really a gaming monitor. It's a 60 hertz monitor. They do claim to have a five millisecond pixel response time, as this is an IPS mode. Uh, panel, but for that you need to put it into like its fast mode, uh, which means you might get some overdrive. This is, however, not a review. <coughs> I'm here to tell you that it does have like a matte kind of finish on it, 3H. Also, one thing you should know, it's curved. It has a 2500R curvature, which is not a very aggressive curve. Um, other monitors that are more gamer oriented will have an 1800R or a 1000R curve. Let's go into the NVIDIA control panel. Where we can see, yeah, it's 21, it's uh, 5120 by 2160 native, and it is, I believe this is a 10 bit panel. Yep, funk. No uh, FRC malarkey. Let's try to put it at 75 and see what happens. This is not uh, representative, like it's kind of a bit of a lottery. 75, it worked, cool. Um, that doesn't mean that yours is going to work. It kind of varies by monitor a bit. But I mean, better than 60. One thing I want to know though is if I switch to HDMI, will I be able to hit the full resolution? Because when I used that LG two years ago, that didn't work. Okay, well it's full screen. That's good. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, right. How long we have to? Uh, actually switching are... to 60 by 9. I think I uh, should. Ah, right. The rest of it is not full res. I feel like I still might have to go to work, but there's no classes, so. Uh, Hell yeah. Fifty-one twenty-five, twenty-one sixty. Okay, well that's great news. Because oh my god, it's about freezing. And it is thirty hertz. So gross. Ah, there it is, guys. Oh yeah, now that I. 
moving the mouse around, it's like. But you have a dictation, dictation device, probably set up at the phone, and you can actually see it, and you can, and like you can discuss with like yourself, and talk to yourself, and say, oh, this is the thing, and you can talk to the group, and do, 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 you know, I have tons of recordings where I've done that. You can do it anywhere. And then if you don't know how to write music, obviously, all of that, then the, then you, you can uh, write the names of the strings, you can write even shapes, you can find your own, make your own notation system, which I've done. I typically write down numbers of notes, I know which is a root chord in my in my idea, and then I kind of hear. That's just because I can do that, and maybe not everyone can do that. So I will recommend that you learn as simple as the beginning of music notation, or tabulature, or that you own an instrument <coughs> that is really always. And actually, owning something like this, it's not pretty all the time, but this, or a guitar, or something, or something, you know, that's really cool. Singing the melody, and, and some way that you could share it with other people who you might be working with on developing. So write it down, capture it. Yeah, so, Mommy, can we go skating on Monday? All of everything I've said so far has to do with either having ideas, uh, you know, honoring the ones that you have, uh, maybe generating ideas through being inspired by text and emotional situation, or I didn't mention it, but you know, a, a painting, another work of art that could uh, inspire you, or in my case, I often get inspired not. by landscapes and, uh, that, and travel, I'd moving like your to. body, all these different things. Um, do I then do? comes what to do with the idea, Maybe. and that might be what you have thought that this work was about, or at least I think that I might be disappointed if nobody even talked about that. So since it's my workshop, here's some things that you can do um, if you are then happy with the beginning of your song. But then what to do, how do you actually then compose, arrange, put different pieces in together, and here are some techniques for that. So, and it's always to remind yourself that this is what a composer does. <laughs> Repeat and vary. That's, that's like, oh yeah, of course, I can, I can play it again. Got it? So I can do... You know, I can do, let's see, what do I have here? Yeah, I can do this. Um, arriving at the station, another rainy day, familiar sensation, as you say. Of course, I have a verse structure, you know, a classic verse uh, structure, verse, verse, chorus, verse, verse, chorus, bridge, show, something. Then the text is leading it for the repetition. But if I just have a melody, if I like it, and variation, um, you could, uh, in variation is actually a really broad term, and I could think of immediately one other way that you can take the melody, and for example, um, 
little more like that. That's actually a completely different melody. But it doesn't feel like it because it's playing the same chords. So that's the opposite of harmonizing the melody. You can also melodize the harmony. <laughs> And you can vary, and it is actually enough to keep something that you feel like you're exhausted, or this is about it, what do I do? Then go back and throw some more emotion on it, you know? Or it doesn't have to be much. It's a little bit like taking yeah. one of the spice jar out of the rack and throwing into a recipe that you've done a million times, and you're like, what happens if I put this here? It's like, just little bits and pieces. It's also enjoyable to do in performance. If you're relaxed and, you know, uh, whatever, if you are performing to other people. But if you're just doing it to yourself, remember this is composing. You're making music that hasn't been, hasn't happened before. Um, oh, and then the next thing, I'm going to keep the guitar because this is going to be a little bit guitar based here. Number seven, add new sections, literally. I would say take a take a break away from the song that you feel is is stuck or that you've gotten as far as it maybe not stuck but if you're like now I can't think of anything else but maybe that's the definition of stuck and add new section oh gotta spell that right add a new section. Or add a new element. Maybe I should have put element, but I don't have time to write, rewrite it. So add a new section or add a new element. Again, for those of you who are songwriters, that's kind of like an obvious thing because you've learned about bridges and oh, you can do this and do that. But I didn't. I'll tell you, when I was 20 something and I was writing this goodbye train, I had never learned about a song's a structure, but I had clearly learned it unconsciously. Because when I got to this, uh, uh, I heard that a few times, you know, and then that was due to my verse, and then no one, no one's here to kiss me goodbye, see me on my way, the goodbye train. And then suddenly I was like, oh, suddenly I'm up there. Remember, this was the divine inspiration song that I didn't really write myself. <laughs> but but it, but looking back on it, exactly what happened was like, okay, now this needs to come. Do the intuition, follow it. I did. It's a good song. And, and then then suddenly, I've got to do something else. Go to minor. And it follows the story. Thing, not running on a breath, but it, it starts typically 
for me anyway, if I do this, okay, what little variation can I do on what I already have? And then, and then I take four for chord for chord. What is the next true chord I hear? chords under my belt. So this is what like I can do with my chords. You will do different things with your chords. This is all I'm saying is, you know, what what seems to be my knowledge of chords is that I kind of want to expand it emotionally and and that's that's the tool that I'm using. So so it's it, that's kind of like my personal journey on writing the song. Uh, and so that was a bridge and then it goes back to the rhythm. And yes, soon enough you can buy, you can buy it on the record. Uh, but if it, it does, you go and Google uh, Ingo Button Gutu or YouTube Ingo Button Gutu and Goodbye Train. There is a sort of semi okay live version of it out there, which which you can um, um, you can check out. We've got uh, a few more minutes, and I've got three more tips for you. So I'm hoping that uh, that's going to work out. Tip number eight is expand. And that kind of comes after what I just said. Expand your musical universe. Be inspired to take this seriously, even if it's not a job, even if it's yeah. a, I don't like the word hobby necessarily for it, but even if it's, you know, not necessarily what you're trained as and you, you know, think for whatever reason, just um, be inspired and, ex and experiment and learn new chords, learn new stuff and, the, and allow those new or melodies or new instruments, new techniques <coughs> and allow those, while you're practicing this new stuff, allow it to give you musical ideas literally in your hands or in your ear you can, that you can uh, play off of. And this this song I'm playing you is an even older song than that. That Goodbye Train is from when I was in my 20s. And here's something I wrote when I was 17 because I had heard some really cool chords. And the, it, it's called Her. It has a personal story. Um, so hang on. Not that pretty. <laughs> Um, and now my computer is actually at the higher office, so I may be able to play the snippet, and I have it recorded, so I'll play the recording. But, so the chords that I had heard while I was actually a cleaning assistant uh, at my dad's offices at the university, uh, and I, I'd heard this um, a Norwegian kind of fusion band play something that I can't replicate at all on the piano, but they had all these chords like this. But it's sort of, you know, Chikoria. Now, all of these, these are like 11 chords for those of you who are into jazz. So I didn't even know. It took me ages to figure them out. And then I thought, okay. So, and then I had an emotional experience and I wrote a melody. There's no text or anything on this. But, um. Dead people voting in now. Impeachment again. When they go low, like on the goodbye train. So that's another little composition technique. Now, I'm just pulling up again, just like with the good white 
he still appears, right? I'm just the same brain that's doing this. Want to do this more and more exciting thing. <laughs> to give you some useful pointers harmonically and physically, but I'm talking about the principle. The principle was, I, you know, I found a uh, chord shape that I moved around in the song, and it was something I heard somewhere else, and I just took it, and I went, I want to explore it, and I want to expand my universe. Uh, if we have time, I'll play, yeah, I think we can just go a little bit over time, and we're just going to play you how it came out with Rick Zielinski on the saxophone. And we recorded this about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. play it very uh, norm normally or oh, straightforward with the, the ballad so it's full presentation of that melody on the chords and then the solo version of it and then a um then it's kind of straight away in the so nothing strange with the form but uh, again i i made no attempt to be clever or anything. I, the only cleverness that was for me is that I was working on these new chords that I heard in a completely different song by much better musicians than me. Uh, two more tips. The next tip is very easy, and I'm not going to demonstrate anything for it because I, um, well, I think I'm maybe running out of time. I do this lot. Not enough. But still a lot. Collaborate. Such a way that the two Remember, we are on the, the second half of the ten tips is about what to do to the move your song forward, and that is key. Collaboration. I know I always do this for my own music, but I do think that writing fan. songs together with other people, or playing and jamming a song with so somebody else, and just letting their ideas that come in, is like working on any kind of project. Collaboration is absolutely key, and also it will expand your universe. And it, for me, it definitely expanded the uh, style. I was going to, uh, I was thinking of playing for you some examples of what I'm doing right now, but I don't think I need to. Um, I just think it's, it's, uh, it's very important. I need to. A composer is very often, you know, just a person sits on their own and does everything and composes. Uh, but, uh, well, mine, mine was, because as I told you, my own was not trying to hide my Beethoven. But, uh, but they probably also, too, but anyway, they did a lot of partying, and we were probably a whole yeah, big party guy, and they probably came up with ideas and jammed with people, so much more than they are. Very sort of refined classical training in my life. The final tip is, uh, is this. What do you say when somebody asks you? Oh, my. Good. How 
There will be other ways of making a melody, and there will be other ways and having fun and having games to play for yourself. I'll give you an example very quickly at the end of this workshop. We'll take a few more minutes. I went to, I learned quite a bit when I went to school for jazz about 10 years ago. I went to NYU, and I, don't, I didn't quite finish this idea, but here's a, here's a game. And this one I will uh, also have available on my website that people can download. Uh, I was hoping that my camera would do more justice to it, but it isn't. But I'm, it's, a, it's a spot. I am going to go through this because even if it looks kind of shoddy right now, I'm going to do it. So the idea is that you can make your music, your melody, your chords, or your... Um, uh, uh, rhythm, you know, if you're writing a melody, maybe a chord will fall into your head, whatever. But let's say just for melody, I'm going to give you an example of doing that. You can you can say that your melody is just going to be one note. This is actually an improvisation Correct. technique, but composing is improvising and writing it down. That's all it is, right? Uh, and improvising is composing on the spot. So, um, so this, I have several of these charts, and, and one is like a chart with just one dot, one line, and the dot is a short event, and a and a long, and a and a line is a sustained event. So there's a, a very sort of like Morse alphabet-like obsessive compulsive grid here, which <laughs> which is not my style, but I love this for working with students for improvisation and composition. So, for example, if you have da da da, if you have here da da da, this is the pitch. So the top line, da da da, and then da da da, da da da, da da da, and that will be somebody who's good on the instrument and can actually control that and think about several things at once. But for composing also, and so for example, imagine the founding fathers. No, the whoever wrote the lovely national anthem of this country, you know, starting here, yeah, but then it comes down to, down here, and yeah, sure, that one, but then it starts again, and then, you know, and then, Actually, it could be written out in dots and lines, very simply. Uh, and then, you know, and then, if, you know, of course, whatever. But if you want to just play one day with your own mind, you don't have a single idea, you hear nothing in your hand, you can touch all the instruments as much as you like, nothing comes to it. Write some dots out, dots and lines, and just see, okay, what is that? It's almost, it's better than letting the computer write for you. Uh, but it's um, it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous. It generates so many ideas for melody. And then you can, of course, devise your own way of, um, of interpreting this as chord or the rhythm event as well. A chord can go on for several bars, that could be a line, or a chord is only played for one bar, it's a short, it's like a dot, relatively speaking, and with rhythm, obviously, it's da 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 or da 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 These are, again, throwing this at the last minute here, some ideas of how, of how the, the, you can generate how, how your mind, which is actually foreign creative, is just dying no. to have something to oh. play with. And if you give it just some dots and some lines, it can come up with a, a beautiful song. Of course, it doesn't have to be three. It can be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, however many you can handle. Those of you who are doing Sudoku or whatever, you can handle seven, eight, nine. Okay, so recapping. Recognize and accept your idea, number one. Two, play ideas, play on your instrument and sing and accept those ideas that come out there and move your body. Maybe music comes when you move, bike or dance or ski or whatever. 
If you are feeling emotional and inspired and just coming out of sleep or have had a beautiful or a nasty experience, it's good fodder, very good fodder. Use it. Use it from text, read something, a poem or just a line or a thought, an idea. Start with that text and see if you hear a melody or hear a chord for several. Capture your idea, write it down, record it, learn some computer software, is that what you want to do? But I think it's writing or singing or playing into a song is perfect. Um, repeat and vary. Once you, sorry, I should stop there. Once you, once you um, want to have, have got ideas and you want to keep moving them forward, how to compose with them and arrange with them, repeat something. Vary it a little bit. Keep something and add something new. Don't tell me you like Star Wars without actually If you add new sections after a while and break away from them, that's number seven. Eight, keep learning, expand your musical universe. Get inspiration from people and sounds and songs you didn't think you could do, but take the time and learn it. Number nine, collaborate with other people. They might know less or more of what you're saying you, but they are different. So together you are bigger and better. And number ten, go back to the beginning again and find completely new ways of writing music that you hadn't thought about before. Dots, lines, what, what do you mean? So, I think that's pretty much everything I had hoped I could cram into 60 minutes and we did it a little bit longer. Um, I'm happy to call it good and thank you very much, but if there are anybody who has a comment or a question, then I can take a Q&A or we can, uh, we can wrap it up. And I think that's probably what we're going to do. And um, my website will appear on some form of information around the recording of this, because we are recording this workshop. And it's the yvgmusic.com. And yvgmusic.com. And uh, you'll find links to music and other information about what I'm doing there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to everybody who made this possible. Thank you to American on the Arts, thank you to Creative Forges, thank you Alaska State Council on the Arts, thank you Akimi, uh, thank you, and let's keep writing music and make the world a better place. Now I am to press the button. Goodbye.